Have you ever been stuck at a revenue level inside of your business and no matter how hard you work, you can't seem to get past it. And you start investing month after month into advertising team members. You watch YouTube videos, you're working more inside your business yet the revenue level stays the same. If anything, your profit margin starts dwindling because of all these expenses and all this time you're investing trying to grow the business. Well, I'm excited for you guys to listen to today's episode where I have a good friend and a client of mine, Kevin, who has a podcast accelerator. And actually, Kevin saw meteoric rise in his business when he first started it. He took it from zero to half a million dollars in the first few months of it, yet he got stuck, maybe where a lot of you are right now, where he couldn't get past a certain revenue a month mark. And he invested into team members and coaching programs and everything and couldn't get it past it. And by the end of this podcast, by the end of this episode, I said something to him that totally revolutionized the way that he was looking at this problem and now has unlocked his ability to master $100,000 plus months. Hope you guys enjoy. Welcome to the Ravi Abuvala Show, where we show you how you can build a business that produces cash without you, so you can live the life you deserve. So Kevin, what is the best decision you've ever made that has eliminated all other decisions? Whoa. Well... The first one that comes to mind is the most recent one that I made. Sure. <laughs> Which is relocating from Philadelphia to Miami. Okay. And I'm two weeks in, um, but I've been an entrepreneur for three years, and I lived in the Philadelphia area for 30 years, and I just turned 30. And, you know, after becoming an entrepreneur, I discovered that there are just so many traits and habits and characteristics about me that were stunting my growth as an entrepreneur. And I was like, what would it look like to just kind of hit the reset button? And like, it's not even that Philly doesn't have what I need. It's just, I have so much of my own habit baggage there. <laughs> habit baggage. That's habit, good, yeah. Right. I just made that up. But like, there was just so many like grooves that I had been stuck in for 30 years. What would it look like to just like hit the reset button and start anew? And you know, it's only two weeks in, but I have felt so many associations and beliefs in my head break already. Like just like, it just feels like I'm in, it's a new life and just a totally new thing. And I feel like I've gotten more done in the past two weeks than in the past like three months at home. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> um, so, so that was, that's the most recent one. Yeah, for sure. Um, other decisions that have eliminated a, mil a, a bunch of decisions uh, COVID helped, <laughs> right? Because, well, so, so for the, for the, you moving down here, it's actually funny you brought that up. Cause I had Jack, our creative director sitting right where you were right before you got here. And I asked him what was his best decision he's made. That's eliminated a bunch of other decisions. And he actually said the exact same thing, moving from New York down to Miami. So I'm, it's funny that you both sat down here and said that. And I even wrote in my notes to discuss that for just a moment, because since you sat down here, right? I asked you how you're doing. You're like, oh, I love Miami. I've been here two weeks. We're talking about Miami. I get up to get you a cup of coffee. Jack's like, so how are you doing? And you're like, man, I love it in Miami. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, this guy loves Miami. Yeah, yeah, huge fan. And like you said, I think it's not, uh, you know, and I, I'm excited to dive a little bit deeper on the, the bottleneck and also talk a little bit about your story because I think that previously this may not have been a possibility for you or wouldn't have been as easy for you to do it, which I think will be good for people listening. But when you said that baggage statement about you had to have that habit baggage over there, I agree. I think it's a habit baggage, but also I think the other thing that you may not be thinking is you've been in Philadelphia for 30 years. Not only do you have habits there, but your identity of who you were previously is associated there. Everybody in Philadelphia sees you, especially because you had a successful podcast there, sees you as this Kevin, here are his habits, here are his actions, here are his beliefs. And so you you know, you stayed in line with that as well, because if you got out of line with that, you'd been uncomfortable in that area. If you were out, other people would have been uncomfortable. And so I think that, like you said, no, no, no disrespect to Philadelphia, Philadelphia for the people that are watching here from Philadelphia, but just the change of scenery in itself, I think allowed you to shed that previous identity. And now you're able to become whoever the hell you want to. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And like, 
Absolutely. Like I'm, I'm the Philly guy and actually my, my, you know, public persona is built off of Philadelphia. And so later this weekend, I'm going to be making a video that's like why I moved to Miami that says, Hey everyone, like I don't hate Philly. You know, I still love you. <laughs> I know, you know? People might be upset. And you know what? I know for a fact that there's people that are going to be upset and they're going to be like, Oh, oh you like created the show about Philly. And then he left once he, you know, got to a certain success level, but you're absolutely right. And what I, what I found is that a lot of that identity stuff, like that you're talking about doesn't even have to have to do so much with the other people. Like, like their expectations for what I would be or who I would be. It's more my own. Like when I'm with these people, this is what we do. Sure. You know, when I'm with these people, we go out and drink. And when I'm with these people, we watch football and eat wings all day on Sunday. And like that kind of didn't like, if I didn't want to do that, they'd be like, okay, man, a lot of the times, yeah. you know, but it's just in my own head. That's what my identity was. And so you're absolutely right, man. Just the, the complete reset. And it felt like such a, a push to become that person. I've had a vision for, the entrepreneur they want to be for a long time. And it just felt like my identity at home in Philadelphia was pulling me backwards. Whereas here, I feel like I'm being pulled forward into that person that I want to be. Yeah, that's incredible. And I, I, I'll, I won't go deep into my yeah. background story on it, but I, obviously I experienced something really similar and I agree with you. Anytime I go back home, whether it's the other, I don't think anybody's being malicious, right? But you just fall back in your old grooves and your old tendencies and old habits. And so first two years uh, after I moved out of my hometown, I didn't go back once for two years. So I, I understand it and it kind of resonate with you go with, but this is an awesome segue a little bit because Kevin, I've watched your journey, I guess now for two years, actually, right? Right around two years, uh, about a year and a half, almost two years from when you know we first started working together to where you are now just because some people obviously don't have the context i'd love for you just in a few minutes to give a background maybe of how you and i first met because i think that's always a funny story to share with people <laughs> yeah. and then when you and i started working together you became a client of scaling systems and then what you were able to create and the business you have now which will segue into the bottleneck exactly again. so I don't know if you know this real quick before answering that question, but when I was here in Miami in, I think it was April or May for one of the many master scaling assistance masterminds sure. that I've attended, yeah. uh, I was in your car. You were like, giving me a ride to a yacht. Yeah, we were going <laughs> to the yacht. Yeah, I still remember that. Yeah. And I mentioned how I just signed this lease in Philly and I hadn't even moved in yet. And uh, I, I said something like, man, it'd be great to move down here though. And you just kind of said something like, I think every entrepreneur should leave home to you know reset themselves. And that planted a seed, my friend. I love it, man. <laughs> and I, I, if I had a nickel, I was telling Jack behind here that I should have my real estate license because we had like 15 to 20 scaling with systems clients yeah. move. And you're what, like a mile down from my house right oh, now? So yeah, down the street. Yeah, literally right around the corner. So I need to start taking referrals from that. But yeah, yeah if, you had, if you had an affiliate link for Miami, yeah, you'd be good to go. <laughs> Mayor of Miami, if you are watching this right now, right? I'm bringing a lot of talented entrepreneurs. That's too. right. But to answer your question of sort of my journey, we met originally way back when. It was actually, I think the weekend after you took the law school admission It's test. exactly what it was, yep. And you were visiting a buddy of yours that you grew up with in Miami, whose name is Cruz. Yep. And we love Cruz. Yes. And I happen to be co remote co-workers with him. We both worked for the same really big health insurance company as software developers. And that weekend was the solar eclipse in Nashville, Tennessee. Yep. And so we all converged at Cruz's place for the weekend. I met you for the first time and we spent four days just partying about the eclipse. It was like five, five or six guys in this like tiny little That's bedroom, right? right? Yeah, Absolutely. Okay. Oh my gosh. Tiny apartment. Yeah. Uh, three guys from Philly, <laughs> you and then Cruz. And, uh, you know, we just, we just party. We were just, you know, having a blast and we drank a ton and that was kind of it. And we left and, you know, we followed each other on Instagram and sure. I was like, oh, that dude was cool. He was nice. He's going to be a lawyer. And then right around the same time, it was funny is that on the drive home, I listened to the, me and my buddy Rend listened to the audiobook the four hour work week nice. on the drive home from Nashville. And so that, and that completely changed the way that I thought about everything. And about a, a, a little over a year later became an entrepreneur myself. I didn't know this, but at the same time, so did you. It was like, you know, summer of 2018. So we were kind of at the same timing the of same entrepreneurship. Step. Right, exactly, which is really cool. However, it didn't go so well for me for the first couple <laughs> of years. <laughs> and so I spent a couple of years as an entrepreneur just absolutely eating shit and just having no idea what I was doing. Like I thought I was this uh, really smart, you know, a businessman guy, but I didn't know the first thing about business. And so fast forward to the beginning of 2020, I was struggling in credit card debt like crazy. Didn't know the first thing about actually having success in business. Meanwhile, you had already taken a company past seven figures. And I watched you on Instagram go from just this dude that I met in Nashville who had, I don't know, a couple hundred followers, I don't remember, uh, to having 150K followers on Instagram, having, you know, starting your second business after taking one past seven figures. 
and tw- and you know, I had gone in the opposite direction. It felt so I was like, all right, I think I should work with this guy <laughs> because then I started seeing your videos and like, I can help you do this too. And I was like, well, clearly he knows something that I don't know. And I'm kind of at my wits end trying to figure this all out on my own. Um, and so I was like, you know what? I'm in, I want like, let's go, man. I want to join the program. And I think I made, fir- I made more money in the first two or three weeks after joining the program and implementing what I learned than I had in like the previous six months. Oh my God, I love that. That makes me so happy to hear. (laughs) Yeah, man. And it's just been an absolute crazy journey since then. Uh, Like learned sales, learned marketing, you know, learned delegation, just these key business fundamentals, but was able to just learn them so much faster than anyone else in my life had. And what's crazy is very quickly, everyone else around me was coming to me for advice for these things. And I, and I could help them with it. And I was able to help them move the needle on their stuff in a matter of months. Um, and so at that point it was on and I just kind of began my evolution as an entrepreneur and really for the first time went all in on something because I was very shiny object syndrome before that different products, different businesses, different ideas, went really all in on my business, which is a podcast accelerator, helping podcasters grow their audience and make more money from that audience. And uh, fast forward a year from when I joined the program, I was making 50 K months already. And to me, I, like I was, I would have been pumped to make 50 K a year before I joined. The program. <laughs> it's crazy. And that's coming from a six figure software job. So like sure. it was, there's a lot of psychological things at play there. Yeah, like, we were talking about that beforehand. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. And I'm like, man, I left this six figure, you know, job and now I'm not making crap. This is harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> but then it was just a matter of like learning the right skills and getting, you know, some good coaching and having the right guidance. And so I joined your high level program, your mastermind, uh, April, one year later. So April, 2021. And since then I've learned an absolute ton, but the reason I'm here today is because my revenue is kind of still stuck at where it was then. So I've learned and implemented a bunch. My team has grown. Uh, I've gone from just me and a virtual assistant and a content assistant to a larger team, a sales rep, an integrator, a content assistant is she's become a content manager. She's, she's learned a ton about marketing. So, and still the virtual assistant, but the thing is revenue is the same. So I'm get I'm super itchy because I'm not making the profit that I was uh, when it was just me, but I obviously don't want to go back to it just being just me. Cause I totally was burnt out by the summer of 2021. I had to take a step back in the business cause I had burned myself out completely. So what I think is the bottleneck where I think I'm stuck is this, where I'm past the solopreneur, just like grind it out like 400 hours a day phase, or at least I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've got this team who are all learning a ton, but it's just the execution is not there. And I haven't figured out how to go from, you know, this one guy who's, who's hired a bunch of people to do certain things and they're kind of doing it. Okay. Like, but it's, they're still not beyond what I was doing it. What I was, when I was doing everything myself, to a place where we're a team, you know, and it's just this lean, mean, you know, incredible group of people that are taking us all, that are greater than the sum of the parts and, you know, taking the business past this, you know, 50K per month threshold. I love it. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll dive into the kind of a little bit more of the problems, but, you know, I'm sure a lot of people watching this and I'm going to even say my second year after scaling with systems, we had almost three X the amount of people we had in the company and our, we were still hitting the same monthly revenue numbers. So I've been exactly where you are right now, where your expenses are slowly creeping up and the revenue is not matching that, which is a little bit of like panic mode. And every month you're paying out salary, you're paying out expenses. And you're like, I was doing even maybe more than this with half the people that I had before. So I'll, I'll tackle that in a minute. And also, you know, I always say this, but while we're on air here, dude, it's been absolute pleasure watching your journey. You know what I mean? Coming from when you first, our first coaching call together to where you are right now. Uh, I know I, some people don't even believe like the journey that you've had. And uh, even some of the people we're talking about, and they're always so shocked whenever. Oh, some you know. of my friends and family also don't believe yeah, it. Don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, they're like, yeah. <laughs> but here you are. I love it. So let's dive a little bit deeper. The first thing, if you don't mind, I, I kind of want to bring up to you is a mindset shift that I had to do when I was looking at revenue and profit, because technically speaking, there's a solution I'm going to give you on mindset and then we're actually going to give you a tactical solution here. The solution on the mindset is this. Let me ask you the question first. Do you feel like you're working more right now than you were back when you were earning, let's just say the $50,000 a month saying consistent at that? Are you working more now or, or are you working a few hours less because you have the team? If I'm being honest, probably a few, yeah, a few hours less. Okay. So arguably speaking, this is for everybody that's watching this is this is actually the mindset shift that I had to make myself is that 
if you're doing this correctly, your dollar per hour is now increasing, right? So <laughs> even though technically you might be making the same amount of uh, top line revenue and your, your expenses are increasing, so your profit is less, if you are spending less time on it, then how much money you're making per hour has increased. And as somebody who every day for three years I've written my journal, time is my most valuable asset, so I don't waste it. The thing that I'm looking the most for is really what's my return on my time? What's my dollar per hour? So if I could make $10 million a year gross and I could make uh, you know uh, $5 million a year profit, but I'm only working 20 hours a week, I'd rather take that than uh, you know, working double that amount of time and making two and a half million uh, dollars a year net, which is what a lot of people do. They think, oh, I don't want my expenses to go up. So I'm going to stay a solopreneur so I can take home hmm. more profit. But in reality, just like you said, before you hired the, those people, you were probably working 50, 60. I mean, I remember we had you uh, just for everyone watching this, you had you and I had a call and you were like, dude, I'm I'm taking a vacation for like a week or two weeks. You're like, I got to get out of here. Uh, right? It was a break point. It yeah. was a really, really it was a tough, really, really difficult time because I didn't see that path forward. Um, and like. You know, and also, I don't know if we want to go into this, but I like I had outpaced my vision a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I was kind of I kind of had caught like my goal was was 50k a month so at this i'm like i didn't know i'd get this so soon like now it's like it's like i caught the carrot and the treadmill was still going yeah. so i'm like what the heck you know and like how do i get past this you know so it was just, it was a heck of a place and yeah it was it was a breakdown um thankfully we're kind of we're past that now yeah, in a better sure. place but you're absolutely right I, I i'm definitely making more per hour which is like so that'll be one of the first things I, i'd let you know and i actually had this conversation with my team uh three weeks ago but almost auditing your time a little bit more you know i do it on once per quarter i literally set up my phone i had an alarm go off every single hour so every hour i set a timer and then i have my journal next to me and i write down what i've been doing for the past hour so this is the basic stuff that we'll go into a little bit more advanced stuff in a moment, but getting a better idea of how you're spending your time and if what you're doing is the highest ROI in your time, even immediately, let's say right now, I'm just going to make easy numbers. You're working, you were before you hired the team and your expenses increased, you were working 60 hours a week. Now you hire the team, you're working 40 hours a week. I would probably argue that there's still five to 10 hours a week that you're doing stuff that either A, doesn't need to be done or B, can be delegated out to somebody else. So instantly without having to change anything other than eliminating something, not doing something, we're increasing your dollar per hour a little bit more. Does that make sense? So I'll give you an example of a few things. So like myself, uh, some of the activities that I do in order to increase my dollar per hour is I, inside of my company, I create better products for our clients. I do one-on-ones with our clients and I create content. I, I kind of run some of the marketing side, especially organic content, such as this podcast, my YouTube channel, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the, I, I isolated myself down to where I was just doing content and creating products for the company. But even then I was like, how do I take that a little bit further? So I actually hired Jack, who's here in the room with us right now, because now before what I was doing, coming up with the YouTube ideas, coming up with the podcast ideas, coming up with the Instagram ideas, then I was filming it, then I was uploading it, then I was uh, getting the revisions from my video editor, then I was posting it, then I was having to handle with quality control from all of that. So realistically what I was needed for was literally just looking at the camera and talking to the camera and everything else was something I could either eliminate or delegate out. And so what I did at that point is now I hired, I have, you know, a, a social media manager, we have a graphic designer, we have a creative director. And once again, my expenses have gone up in that category, but at the same time, now all I do is sit down like this morning, sit down with you. We talk for an hour. And then after that, I'm done with that whole experience. And now I can move on to either a, the next thing, or inside the business that helps the business grow or B, I can enjoy my life and I can go do fly my plane or do something else like that. So I've isolated what is actually required for me to help grow the business. And it's for me, like, you know, I can't really have somebody else sitting here talking to you. Maybe in the future I will, but I can't in the beginning. And so that's what I'm needed for. And then everything else I've delegated out to somewhere else. Does that make sense? It does. And, and I have a question for you sure. there. So one thing that I, a theory that I have about um, how I've behaved as I've grown is that I feel like I've tended to behave as though I'm a couple steps ahead of where I actually am. Got you know? it. So what comes to mind when you say that is, you know, my first reflex is great. I'm going to go back and, you know, just do my like genius zone tasks. But, and that's kind of what I did this fall. But what I realized is that a lot of the other stuff isn't there yet to, to go on its own. So like, I kind of like when I hired my first sales rep, I kind of abdicated sales. Like I wasn't really, we were meeting once a day, but 
we were really doing much and, and this guy hadn't done high ticket sales before. Yep. And I just kind of like said, have at it, man. Good luck. <laughs> you know? And like he did fairly well, fairly okay. But then when the time came where he went through, you know, a little bit of a dry spell, which happens to all sales reps, uh, you know, th- we just didn't have that, that conversation. Like he, he sunk to a, I think a 14% close rate in November, only sales rep for the whole company. And that became crisis mode. Yep. And at that point I was like, ah, but I gotta, I gotta be focusing on these high leverage things. And then there came a day where I was like, all right, maybe it would be higher leverage for me to spend some time. Exactly. We started doing, uh, act sharpening calls together one-on-one every single day. And this month he's at 29%, you know, just, just in a couple months, he's just almost, yeah, almost pretty much doubled his close rate. And the dude is just like, already becoming a killer he's like yeah. starting to say stuff i'm like whoa that's really cool but the thing that you you've already kind of answered your own question there but the thing that we need to identify is that i would argue then that sales is one of those few things that you have to spend your time on like doing the act sharpening calls doing the morning meeting calls i think that okay cool we've identified that you need to be there for that and to give you an example even when i was removing myself from a lot of different areas right we're always trying to get how, what's the biggest roi in my time so for me to uh, be listening to individual salespeople's calls at the point that I'm at right now doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So eventually I hired a sales team manager or sales team leader, and now he manages all the day-to-day sales. And then I kind of, he reports to me and we have conversations back and forth about how. So you're not at that point. So you're right. You don't want to play four or five, six steps ahead of you. Like when I took on the salesperson, I don't think there's a much, many more things an entrepreneur that can be better for their company than doing sales, right? There's not anything else that brings in cash into the door. So you don't want to be like, especially technical founders. Oh, I hired a salesperson. I'm off of sales. And, and no one loves sales because it's an hour of your time. Some people, times you don't show up. Sometimes they're not qualified, but realistically, I would say, especially in the beginning, no matter what, that's something that you need to be doing. And if you remember what I talked about earlier with my activities, I do marketing, but marketing and sales are interdependent, right? They're pretty much the the same thing. So as a CEO, you definitely have to keep one foot in the door when uh, when it's concerned with that, but it's a higher return on your time. So let's say right now, when I first hired the sales rep, I would have probably given him 50% of the calls and then I would have taken 50% of the calls. That way, in case that person was absolutely terrible, we the company didn't plummet. Then at the same time, they could be listening to my calls and I don't have to be coaching that person. And then the next step above that would start hosting daily calls, but it would have been group calls with your sales rep and you. Then you could hire another sales rep and the amount of time that you would have to spend does not increase at that point. If anything now, the original sales rep that you have is performing at KPI. You can remove yourself from the daily sales calls. And now you're just hosting sales team meetings every morning, which is what I did for a very long time, about a year. And then at some point, the next stage in that would be to get a sales team leader. Maybe it's the first guy that you originally hired that had that drought. Then he came back and now he's crushing it. Then he becomes a sales team leader. And now you're fully removed from everything sales. And maybe you're on the marketing side. So I think what you said about being too many steps ahead is something that I see a lot. And it's not that you did anything wrong, but I think we just have to go back to what I said in the very beginning about auditing your time and understanding like, cool, I don't think there's anything you can do inside the company other than marketing and sales. That's like going to be the biggest, especially where you're at right now, return on your time. I honestly don't, right? Even creating a better product right now, I know you're launching the new version of your products, but you already have so many case studies and testimonials that like, let's say if you didn't increase the quality of the product, which is not what I'm saying you never want to do, but I'm saying that that wouldn't be my number one priority because it doesn't matter how great your product is if you don't have people coming in to buy the product. So that's probably what I would would recommend now at the very least is start looking at the leverageable items that you can do. And then, for example, like I don't think that you editing a podcast or you editing your YouTube videos would be the most important thing that you'd need to do. And so you looking at the camera and speaking is obviously the most important thing. You interviewing or coming up with ideas of who you're going to interview, that's not something you should do. Somebody else can do that for you. So we're getting back to kind of the dollar per hour. And if we go break down to where you are right now, revenue, your dollar per hour is increasing. Now, what we want to look at is how can we do more things that bring in more money so you have more revenue? And realistically, on a day-to-day basis, how many hours or how many activities would you say you're doing that's bringing in more uh, revenue for the company, more profit for the company? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, like, how many hours am I working? Because the thinking is that everything that I'm doing is bringing in revenue. <laughs> like, so, so, that, so that's that's what we're kind of trying to break down here. Yeah. So, how much of what you're doing is, you know, actually, let me rephrase that. What are some of the things that you're doing on the daily basis? Yeah, right? sure. So walk me through that. Yeah. So uh, mainly, I start out with the act sharpening call for an hour, and then there's about thirty minutes of you know team meeting stuff. 
Um, and then I have about two to three hours of needle moving work where I try to do my one thing. That is very rarely recently efficient. Okay. <laughs> and what is that one thing of recently? What, what, what would it be? What um, it? like in a given day, it might be like something, oh, what's a good, what's an example? Um, you know, improve the, I don't know, what's an example of one day that was one thing that I've done in a day, uh, improve the click through rate of an ad or like make a new ad that, you know, has a better click through rate than the one that we have now cool. or something like that. And when was the last time you did the one thing? That one thing? Yeah, or, or just any one thing? Cause you just say that. It, it well, yeah. So I mean, the last time I had a session where I started, like it was a focus three hours, had one, like had a clear, I got to do this thing and then stayed focused and did the whole thing for three hours. I don't know. Okay. I couldn't tell you. Cool. Um, so then after the one thing, uh, what happens at that point? Like, so after you, if let's say you assumed you had the three hours <laughs> right. of work, right? We'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah. And then what's the rest of your day looking like? Uh, so on Mondays and Thursdays, it's appointments. So it'll be coaching my clients. It'll be uh, one-on-one -on -one sort of like, we have like a week, a weekly content meeting or like a weekly meeting with my integrator or something like that. Um, any other uh, appointments that come up? Uh, some of them are, I do my onboarding calls now. I added those back recently because our customer results actually weren't as where we wanted them to be. Um, so I, I do client onboarding calls. Um, and then Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I used to have only appointments on Mondays and Thursdays, but in December when I was like, I need to meet with my team more cause it's just not effective and I need to get, you know, help them get to a place where they're effective. Uh, I've been taking appointments sometimes on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. But and who are those appointments with? Um, well, sometimes team, sometimes mainly team, and sometimes uh, clients. Okay. Got it. And are clients booking anytime they want to on your calendar? What does that look like? So I recently put it back okay. <laughs> to clients can book. M Mondays and Thursdays are my client calls. Also... Uh, every other Friday, the, the main content driver for our business is my podcast, which, cause I'm a podcast guy. So, sure. you know, huge piece of it. And so I do podcast interviews on, on Friday. I used to do every other Friday. Um, but I'm going to start doing every Friday cause we want to increase produce more yeah. amount of podcasts. Okay, cool. All right. So, I mean, a typical schedule and, and I love it. I think you, we've already, you know, sometimes it takes somebody else to say it to you, but obviously getting back on the one thing is going to be the number one priority here, right? The issue right now is right now you're trading your time. Uh, and we're going back to lowering the dollar per hour that you're working at inside your business. So uh, this is a mistake that I see a lot of high level entrepreneurs make is like, cool, we hired people to help remove you from certain aspects of the company. But then you replace that void of time instead, instead of with high leverage activities with very low leverage activities, such as one on ones. Right. So, you know, you, in order to quote unquote, increase customer success, you, um, open back up one-on-one -on -one onboardings, one-on-one -on -one calls with you, et cetera, et cetera. Once again, we just, uh, you know, the, the saying out of the fryer into the frying pan, hmm. it's like something varies or out of the fire into the frying pan. And something similar to that is, is now you're right back to where you were before, except for now you're making less money, uh, than you were before. Cause you're paying more payroll. So the few things that I'd probably look at doing is at the very bare minimum, getting at least one hour of the one thing in every single day. It's just a non-negotiable, right? Wake up an hour earlier, move a meeting back. Just absolutely no questions asked. Even on the days that I have meetings from nine until 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., I still at least do one hour. That's yeah. why I wake up at 5 a.m. So, so the, well, I don't mean to cut you off. No worries. Uh, I've got. I've had more than enough one thing time on my calendar uh -huh. always. And the I think my biggest problem that has confused me the most is that maybe it's just like the prioritization of figuring out what the what one is thing the one thing be. exactly because like on one hand, I felt like I feel more distractible when I'm not clear on what I should be doing. Like if I'm just like, I need to do this thing today and it's going to produce X, then, I'll, then I'm really good at blocking everything out, you know, but I think that like, that's where I've struggled where it's like, there's all these things that I can and should be doing right now. What's the, what's the really, truly the one thing that I need to do today. And so, and that like lack of clarity leads me to procrastinate, I think. Yeah. And I, I think that's fair. And, and the cool thing about having you on here, Kevin, is that you're uh, pretty transparent about everything and your own shortcomings. I have shortcomings, everyone has shortcomings. So I appreciate you doing that. I'm going to circle back to that one thing, uh, answer for you sure. in a second. Cause there's just two or three things I want to rip to yeah. you that I'd probably do. Also, I would probably just take my ax sharpening calls from one hour down to 30 minutes. Okay. I would then replace that second 30 minutes that I had with that, with my team meetings that you're doing every single day. I'd also probably argue, are you doing team meetings every day? We just started that. Okay. 
I would probably move axe sharpening and team meetings to three times a week. You can do axe sharpening every day if you think that it's necessary, but the team meeting stuff, there's nothing that you're going to say between Monday and Tuesday that the size of your team you have right now is going to be such, it's not like you guys are like on the cutting edge of technology and one thing's going to change in the code and the whole system's going to be down. Right? So I went from meetings every single day to meetings uh, three times a week to now I do one meeting with my team every single Monday. So I'm not saying you're at that point, but I'm saying that easily in order to get back some of your time, I almost guarantee you that if you went to just three meetings a week with your team, you'd probably not really recognize any difference in it. Yeah. You, are you on the same page with me on that? I So yes, um, the like what I'm thinking, my question for you yeah. is where the reason why, cause I had that in mind when I did it daily, I'm like, sure. And it was more of a like, you know, cause I went from meeting once a week with the team and once a week individually with each person. And I, I just didn't find like, th there was not enough of a feedback loop. I, th I felt, I thought there, this was the thinking behind the decision where like each person was clear on what, what to do in their role why to do it, how to do it, like those sorts of things. Like I found that like just bringing somebody on, the people that I'm bringing on are not people who have done their role over and over again. Sure. Like it's, you know, folks that are all, that are learning a lot at the same time. And so while the people <laughs> that I have do when they know what to do, like work really hard and they, and also when they don't know what to do, but they know what the goal is, like they're very good at figuring out what to do, but they were just floundering. Like, like, and I think that, I think that the, and we'll talk about the talent thing, but I think that you're not giving them so like you need to have what we call fallback activities for these people to do. So it's like, Hey, if you're not doing, um, if you, if you have free time or between Monday and Tuesday, here are the things that I want done by Wednesday. And realistically, most people that I've noticed, uh, even inside of our company, it's that we have too much stuff for people to do. And so we have to extend out timelines and deadlines for you. It sounds like you're not having enough to be able to delegate out, which might go back to some of the one-on-one -on -one stuff that you're doing with your team. Like, I'll give you an idea as well. There's probably somebody on your team, which is one of the other things I want to bring up that could probably take over some of the one-on-ones uh, or the onboarding calls. Like for example, the onboarding calls, I don't know if you're giving absolute incredible revolutionary ideas on those onboarding calls, or if it's more like, Hey, here's the general things of how the program works and here's how we should do it. But if you were able to delegate out your onboarding calls to say your integrator or somebody else, and it was more, they followed the structure, they watched the last 50 onboarding calls that you did and they have a better idea. I mean, at this point, they've been working with you for a while. They can then say, Hey, here are the questions, uh, or here's where you can find things. Here's the coaching calls and then hop on the group call tomorrow and ask Kevin or tell Kevin exactly where you're at. So that way you're done with the onboarding calls. You can maybe still offer a one-on-one, -on -one, although eventually you want to remove yourself from that. And between shifting the team meetings, like there's Parkinson's law, which is work will expand to fill the amount of time you give it. So if you're saying it's going to take five days a week for me to get my team ramped up, it will take five days a week. If you say it'll take three days a week to get your team ramped up, it will take three meetings a week. That's, that's all you need. So I would challenge you to do the three meetings a week and we can go deeper when we're off camera as well. But three meetings a week, First one's 30 minutes, keeping the meeting tight and keeping it so that at the end of whoever you're talking to, there's expectations as far as what's the next move that this person needs to do and when is it due by. Then you have the, the sales meeting for another 30 minutes. So we just took an hour and a half, brought it down to just an hour. And then you sw delegate out your onboarding calls. I would even challenge you. So if you're saying, hey, I don't have somebody that can do the onboarding calls one-on-one uh, -on -one right now, switch them to group onboarding calls where you're hopping on the call and this is for just people that joined in the last five days or people that joined in the last seven days. First five minutes is you explaining this is how the program works. And then the last is just like kind of more of a typical uh, coaching call, except for this is more for beginner questions that people just got on there. Once again, your dollar per time increases. I would say that arguably, you, it, it, arguably it's not going to make any difference on the customer success journey in the end. Like, I don't think it's going to be like all of a sudden, if you do the group onboarding that they're going to stop getting results from it. And then let's say you're doing five onboarding calls a week or three onboarding calls a week. That's another three to five hours that we just took back of your time. Are That's you with crazy. me so far on everything? Yeah, and they'll also like, there will be like a cohort like people will feel like that are all together in a, well, you know, inside of our, one of our programs remote inter integrator Academy, we do group coaching calls for that reason. And then we set people up in what we call accountability groups. So that everybody is on the same journey and wow. the same path. They all started at the same time together. And it also builds a sense of community. Hmm. With it, right. And then now that we have a lot of this time back then, and then we can talk about one-on-ones. I would probably remove the one-on-ones. If you're doing a lot of one-on-ones, it's likely because 
the course material itself is not answering all the questions that they need answered. Yep. And one of the issues that you might be having, which is what I had, was like, oh, well, I'll just wait till the new launch comes. But in reality, that's never the case. I would just start creating answers that people are asking, typically doing those one-on-one -on -one calls put those as modules inside of the course that you have right now, even if it's a little hodgepodge because they just want the information in the end. And then if someone asks you for that question, you can just send them to that course. I'll give you an example. In between 2.0 and 3.0 of Scaling with Systems, we actually, uh, I was doing those one-on-ones to try to patch up that process. And I just took literally the entire call that I had with that person and put it inside the course. Hmm. So I didn't even create a separate thing because I knew I was eventually going to create a separate one. And then whenever someone asked me that same question, like, how do you run YouTube ads or how you do that? I would just say, hey, watch this video inside of here. We're on the same page with oh, all this? Oh, yeah. Then the final kind of thing to wrap up, the one thing is that Yes. Identifying what that one thing is that moves the needle forward is going to be the most important thing for you. Because if we don't do this, then we're going to go fall right back into the habits that we've been doing this time before, or you're going to procrastinate. You're going to fill the time with something else. I know that we had ads working with you uh, a while ago. My one thing would be like, cool. What's the highest impact thing that somebody else can't do um, that has the most ROI for my company? The podcast is probably big. So that's one thing that you can do for the podcast. But podcast is not exactly something where it's like turn the dial and you instantly get yeah. more people right i know because we're shooting three youtube videos a week it's not like all of a sudden we're getting two three times the views than we were before so i would focus on something else where i could do that which would be you know two areas that have worked really well for you i know in the past cold email and ads so my one thing every single morning would be spending more money on ads, creating more ad creatives, trying a new ad platform, creating new retargetings, maybe email blasts or email uh, newsletters to get people in the door and or the outbound messaging. What's the status in the outbound messaging? Should I be going out and finding another virtual assistant to be doing the outbound messaging? You know, what's the the efficiency of the funnel? What's the response rate? And if you spend your time on that and only on really those two main things and you don't get uh, sidetracked then you should see the growth that you want inside your company. And I'll wrap all of that and answer your questions up with saying this. I myself have like, my one thing is always revenue driven. It is always direct revenue driven. YouTube videos, uh, sales letters, low ticket funnels, ads. And then let's say you want to launch the second version of it. You have a product you want to work on the back end. I know this might sound confusing, but I have a second one thing where that's like the end of the day, like that, because that's technically not as important for me as the ads and marketing. So I wouldn't let your one thing get convoluted with things that aren't really the one thing, such as creating the second version of your product hmm. or, you know, doing a one-on-one -on -one with clients or whatever else it is, because technically speaking, that is not the direct impact on your ROI. And until you can either delegate out um, or automate that lead generation to the point that it's growing without you, that needs to be your one thing for the next 365 hmm. days. Got it. Wow. Yeah, that's clear. It's funny this morning. So one of the one things that has been a one thing for a while uh, was that I've been working on is like, I have never been consistent with tracking my KPI numbers ever. And I think that there's a lot of entrepreneurs like that. Sure. I hope so. <laughs> uh, and so this morning before coming here, I was like, oh, I got to know. He's going to ask me my KPIs. <laughs> like, he's going to ask me these numbers. I got to get them ready. And through the course, it took me like an hour. Through the course of doing it, I was like, it informed so much. It makes crystal clear where the bottleneck is at that point. And like, there were a couple, and like, the problem was like the actual, like, how do I calculate them? Where do I track them? And like, you know, how do I get them quickly and look at them? And so this morning, you know, I just was like, oh, I built this spreadsheet really quickly. I got a degree in software. So like I could figure this out. And but I was always like, oh, there's this message. There's this asset review. There's this, all these other things that are distracting me. And this morning I went just finally went and did it and looked at it. I was like, man, this was really the one thing that would make everything else easier or unnecessary if I just did it. Wow. Um, so like coming from that experience on the way here, this all resonates deeply. And with the KPIs, like that's a mistake I see a lot of my clients making, especially in the scaling initiative where they have access to me and Raj and like we're, we have these custom dashboards with all these things. And I just every the game is all about simplification. So sure, like if you have tracking 50 different KPIs, but they're on a, a website or a dashboard somewhere else, it's hard for you to access yep. it. It becomes difficult. I took my original company, Prospect Social, to seven figures just by Meljane posting in a Slack channel called Numbers 
how many emails we sent out uh, yesterday, what was the response rate, what was the booking, and how does that compare with that time last week? Then we do the same thing with month to date and then last month to date. So I could just look at, are we doing, like literally within, let's just say 10 lines of text, I could figure out exactly, and I talk about this, uh, I call it a scorecard, I could figure out exactly, are we on the uptrend or the downtrend on, um, on where we need to be right now? And I'll give you an example. Last week, uh, we were doing our sales and marketing meeting every Friday, and I noticed that our booking rate for our other offer, Remote Integrator Academy, was at 20%. So 20% of people that purchased our low ticket masterclass booked an appointment uh, to speak about ascending into one of our other offers. The month before month to date, booking rate was 40%. So I immediately saw that we were literally half the booking rate that we were last month at this time. And so because I had that data and I could see that immediately, all I did was I typed out an email and a text message blast. And it wasn't even like my best crafted email. I didn't go into copywriting. I was like, hey, we're looking to help three to five more you know, people escape the nine to five and create an income online. If you're still interested, click here to book a time. And we had, I don't know, 22 to 28 booked appointments literally within 24 hours of doing that. And boom, we went right back hmm. up to the KPI number. So the faster you can identify where the bottleneck is, then the faster I could figure out. So my one thing that next morning was typing out that SMS blast, that email blast. So I think that that's a great insight that you should start doing is having somebody else, such as your integrator or somebody else in your company, every night before they log out, their number one priority is to get you the KPIs of, you know, opt-ins or new leads or new booked appointments or new closed deals. But the most important thing is that number by itself isolated is useless. So we have to figure out what was month to date last month. What was that decision? What were we at then? And then if we're lower month to date last month, then you can identify, okay, the issue is that last month we had better lead to booking rate, or maybe last month we had a better show up rate, booking to show up rate, or maybe we had a better close rate. And then you can just adjust accordingly. My one thing today will be taking sales calls because my close rates down. My one thing today will be red zoning some of the uh, demo completed and not closed that my sales guys didn't close. I'm going to pick up the phone and call those people and be like, yo, it's Kevin. I saw you spoke to Bob. You didn't close. Why didn't you close? Boom. Sales rates up. It's lead to booking rate. We do an email blast or text message blast, or maybe just overall number of new leads are down. Then we increase ad spend or the number of messages that we're sending out. So if you look at it through the data KPIs, it becomes a game of science. But in order to do that, you have to have that data accurately, be able to compare it. And then you have to have the time to be able to sit down and be like, cool, today, the only Slack channel you open up every morning at 8 a.m., is the numbers channel yeah. and figure out, okay, I already know based on that, I need to spend my time the next three hours doing this one thing there. Then you do that and, and you do that for 90 days straight and you'll almost guarantee you, you'll feel yourself coming out of let that little kind of hole that you're in right now. What, what I'm hearing also is that, or what I'm seeing in this is that, you know, I mentioned before how my biggest, uh, what a huge problem was figuring out what the one thing is. And really quickly before we go forward, for those of us that don't know what the one thing is, the one thing is essentially when you've identified, hey, this is the goal that I want to get to in five to 10 years. And this is the thing I need to do every year to get that goal in 10 years. This is the goal I need to do every month to get that goal in a year. This is the thing I need to do every week to get that goal every month. And this is the thing I need to do every day to get that goal every week. You recommended the book to me. It's the one thing, but I think Gary Keller. Gary Keller is exactly who it is. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, what's the one thing I could do today such that by doing it, everything else is easier or unnecessary. And to give you a great example, what we're doing right now, I identified out, I visualize every single morning and identified out in five, 10 years where I want to be. The one thing that I need to do to get there, it's not more money. Uh, it's not more businesses. It's not more vacations. It's more eyeballs. I need more attention hmm. to get to where I wanted to go, which is why we ramped up the amount of YouTube videos we're doing, which is why we created this podcast. It's why we increase our advertising spend is because all I need is more eyeballs to make that happen. So for me, my problem has been I've put time aside in the day to day to do that one thing. But during that time, I don't really do a one thing because I've just had a lot of trouble figuring out what that one thing is. So what do we do about that? Probably because I wasn't looking at these numbers. Sure. I couldn't tell. You're just see, guessing. Yeah, it's just all based on feeling and guesses. Which is like literally the worst thing in the world is to base <laughs> it off of emotion. Because like if you base it off of emotion, it's that's what 99% of people do is just be like, oh, this is how I'm feeling today. Or 
right before you went to bed last night, a customer messaged you and said, Hey, Kevin, this, oh. you know, this is not what I thought it was going to be. This program, the course isn't good, whatever else it is. Right. I'm not saying that happens, but you know, it does happen to everybody. So then what do you think is the first thing that you're going to do in the morning? Probably go in and try to, oh, I got to create a better course. I got to create a better, when in reality you've had 400 clients and only one person's complain, right? So human beings are so emotional based that they'll decide their day-to-day -day actions on in the current emotion state that they're in right now, which is why if you just rely solely on the data and the important KPIs and only making those KPIs, you know, three to four numbers that you're looking every day. So you don't have 500 things that you, you can do, then you'll be able to identify this is the thing that I need to do based solely on data and logic and not based on the emotional side of things. Got it. So I thought that the constraint was on the business, coming into this conversation, I thought that the constraint was me teaching my team how to do stuff, when in actuality, and then like spending more time with them. But it sounds like that was the yeah, that, that was, was part the of the constraint, and it was how I was spending my own time, and not, and, and the constraint was me just not going by data, and being able to quickly identify what's working and what's not and solve that problem instead. Awesome, Kevin. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show today. I think this Thank was you. really valuable. I mean, a lot of people probably are where you're at right now. I mean, dude, you're doing awesome. I mean, you're, you're making uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. You're about to be on your first seven figure run rate, million dollar business working from your home and that's incredible and you're really and you're impacting a lot of people. I've you know, I've worked with you one on one, so I see the testimonials, I see the case studies. I know what you're doing is making a difference. Um, and it's just, I think, getting better idea of where your time is being spent. But for people that are watching this, maybe they want to ask you a few questions. Maybe they're starting a podcast and they want a little bit because you've also given us an incredible amount of insights on our podcast we're launching here. And you've been super helpful. What's the best place for people to ask you a question, connect with you or yeah. learn a little bit more about the company? Yeah, so it might not sound like it, but we do actually have a really good operation going <laughs> on over here based on the problems you just heard. Uh, but you know, we do have over 150 clients in our podcast accelerator program. We help podcasters to grow their audience minimum 25% month over month, usually we're able to see 50 to 100% month over month. And then we also help those clients not only grow that audience, but make more money from that audience. And so anyone who's interested in that can just check out the Grow the Show podcast right here in the podcast app. We're also on YouTube as well, Grow the Show. Uh, and you know, we got tons of free content out there that'll help you move the needle right now on how to do that. Uh, and then of course, if you want to take the next step, you can join the Facebook group and you know, we've got other stuff going on, but the number one thing to do is to check out the grow the show podcast, grow the show podcast, both on YouTube and whatever, uh, podcast thing that you're listening to. I can't recommend Kevin enough. He's an awesome guy, really, really humble. And I know he takes care of his clients. Kevin, I cannot thank you enough for showing up today. And I appreciate you, uh, kind of unveiling your business and yeah. the problems for everybody that's listening. Thanks for the help, man. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode half as much as we enjoyed putting it on for you. Now I have two very important announcements I need your attention for. Number one, we are giving away $50,000 worth of value in cash and prizes. All you have to do is go to scalingwithsystems.com slash giveaway and you can enter in your details and get all the information of the giveaway there. And number two, if you did get value out of this episode, all I'm asking Asking is that you leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you're on and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. We put a lot of energy and time into this and that is a signal to both myself and the very hardworking team I have here that you guys are getting value out of it and you appreciate it. So scalingwithsystems.com slash giveaway to get up to $50,000 worth of prizes and also be sure to leave a five-star review and subscribe. Thank you guys so much for your time and I'll see you in the next episode.